Oh man, looks like it's that time of the year already. Time to make yet another worst YouTubers list. These are easily the videos that I put the most effort into, which is kind of sort of sad considering how these videos aren't really that hard to make either, but still, they definitely take the longest, and I constitute that as putting more effort into these videos than I do with my regular, like, five to seven minute long videos. But enough about me rambling about how effortless my content is. Throughout this year, I compiled ten individuals on this website who were pretty egregious, who I felt would be perfect contenders for this year's list. I should probably explain how this list works first for any newcomers who may come across this video, considering last year's list garnered over 3,000 views. Jesus, let's hope this one performs just as well, maybe even better, who knows. Anyways, I'm not really that concerned over the order I place these YouTubers in. I usually save the most disgusting person for last, but this isn't your typical top 10 list. This goes from 1 to 10, not like most other lists that go from 10 to 1. Anyways, with that out of the way, let's finally wrap up this intro. These are the worst YouTubers of 2021, at least according to me. <laughs> I've went back and forth when it came to including this channel on the list because this isn't your traditional YouTube channel where it's run by one individual person, but rather it is a business comprising of several staff members, but considering the controversy this channel was in earlier this year, I really couldn't come up with any good justification not to include this channel on the list. Game explain. If you pay even just a moderate amount of attention to the Nintendo Sphere here on YouTube, there is a very good chance that you have heard about the channel Game Explain. They upload reviews of the latest hot Nintendo games. When a Nintendo Direct comes out, they're out with a Nintendo Direct analysis video or an analysis of a trailer that just came out for a new Nintendo game that is coming up. Basically, any time big news goes on with Nintendo, within the blink of an eye, this channel already has a video out about it. There is a bit of a dark reason as to why this channel cranks out content so damn fast after a Nintendo Direct or a new trailer drops or a new game releases. Back in January, former Game Explain staff members brought to light that Andre C. Seegers, the founder and current owner of Game Explain, keeps most of the channel revenue for himself while giving just measly little droppings to his crew members, while giving them absurd amount of crunch time. For example, a former staff member by the name of Steve Bowling was required to finish the Final Fantasy VII Remake, a 33-hour game, within a 48-hour time span, so he can quickly get a review for the game out for Game Explain. He has a wife and full kids, had a full-time job while Game Explain was a side gig, put in all of this time and effort into beating this long-ass game, and not only that, immediately after, had to begin writing up the review for the game. All of this work for a whopping $550 a month. Andre claims that he never required bowling to finish the game without any sleep, but he still doesn't really look good because he never made any attempt to stop bowling from doing this. He would work anywhere between 50 to 150 hours, but it didn't matter. His pay was still $550 fucking dollars. Like, how do you excuse that? How do you pay someone that fucking low when they put that much effort into to your YouTube channel. Another former staff member named John Cartwright went unpaid for nearly a year until eventually being paid only $25,000 a year despite writing and publishing videos essentially all day for Game Explain. From Vice, most days I would start work at 9 a.m. with a video request from Seegers just as he was going to bed, said Cartwright, who was based in the UK but often worked hours friendly to the US. These requests sometimes didn't stop until midnight or the early hours of the morning. If a Nintendo Direct aired, I would sometimes find myself working up to 18 hours to cover its contents. The workload was agonizing and made me dread Nintendo Directs. Again, all of this just for 25k a year. Or about 19,000 pounds a year, considering this person is in the UK, but still. An unacceptable amount of money for the amount of work they put into this channel. Unfortunately, Game Explain came out rather unscathed. They received a huge amount of backlash for like, I don't know, two weeks, and then people forgot about it, and their channel is doing just fine now. A pretty positive like-to-dislike ratio, decent amount of views on each video. They're chugging along just fine. I would hope working conditions improved dramatically, 
following this drama, but I would not be surprised if things have not changed at all, considering that drama subsided rather quickly and the channel made a fast rebound. So don't be shocked whatsoever if any more horror stories come out in the future surrounding Game Explain's horrible work environment, because I certainly won't. This makes me really glad I haven't watched a single Game Explained video past, like, age 13. <laughs> Jimmy Dore is part of what I like to call the populist brain rot left, and put like 10 quotation marks around the word left. He'd rather align himself with a far-right, white supremacist organization like the Boogaloo Boys and sanitize them on his show, all for the sake of them being populist, or rather, faux populist. They're just masquerading as populist, because let's be real here, there's no such thing as a right-wing populist. Then, milk toast liberals who vote Democrat, because it's worse being a lib than a literal white supremacist, am I right? They hate wealthy elites, Jimmy Dore hates wealthy elites, must be a match made in heaven, am I right? And Jimmy Dore on his show constantly sanitizes these types of people, no matter their end goals. All you have to focus on is the fact that they hold a similar distribution trust in the government and they don't like wealthy elites. That's all that should matter. Doesn't matter how racist they are, doesn't matter any bigoted views they may hold or anything of the sort, you still should align yourselves with these kinds of people because they are populists. Look, I don't like the Democratic Party either. I choose not to participate in the voting process in this country anymore for a myriad of different reasons that I'm not going to go into in this video. Maybe I will in a future video, I don't know, but... I'd rather ally myself with a milquetoast liberal who votes Democrat because I know, on many social issues, they agree with me. They agree with the left. Or at the very least, they're far more likely to be more sympathetic towards social issues than a fucking boogaloo boy. And this is easily what I hate the most about Jimmy Dore's show. He spreads the message that populism good no matter the person's end goals, no matter what the person's ideology is. If they hold a distrust in the government, if they hate wealthy elites like you do, they must be an ally, right? Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm not gonna align myself with literal fascists because they may hold some faux populist beliefs. Thank you very much. And of course, let's not forget his sexual harassment scandal, where he brought up and laughed about his inappropriate remarks he made towards his former co-worker, Anna Kasparian. And he brings up the same classic victim-blaming excuses. Well, it was the dress she wore. It was inappropriate for a work environment, so I had to step up and say something. Ugh. And his audience ate this shit up. They really did not care at all that Jimmy made an unwanted, sexually charged remark that highly embarrassed Anna. And his audience ruthlessly attacked her. They called her a liar or a slut. Really not unlike how a right-wing audience reacts to these types of things. Oh, wait. Jimmy cultivates right-wingers in his audience. You see, since Jimmy's content primarily revolves around bashing the left and hardly ever dishing out the same type of scrutiny towards the right, it tends to attract a lot of right-wingers. Look at his critical race theory video. One of the very, very few times he throws shit at the right, and his audience freaked the fuck out, because as you probably know, the whole critical race theory discourse is nothing more than stupid culture or bullshit that is so prevalent among the right wing. And now he's playing into the anti-vaccine crowd, posting videos on the regular, reaffirming their beliefs. A great YouTuber named Sean, S-H-A-U-N, made an excellent, excellent video last month going after Jimmy Dore's anti-vaccine bullshit. There's a segment in the video where Sean showcases that Jimmy, or Jimmy's team, purposely rewrites articles that Jimmy showcases snippets of in his videos to fit Jimmy's narrative better. Now, sharp-eyed viewers will have noticed that what Dore just read out is not what the article says. And let's look at them side by side here. The article says, Throughout July and August, cases in Singapore ticked up to over 100 per day after nearly a year of almost no infections due to the city's previous zero-tolerance policy. Emphasis on the word previous there. Then it goes on to say, that policy included stay-at-home orders, intensive testing, and so on. Jimmy Dore's text says, the speed at which cases have climbed despite policies, including stay-at-home orders, intensive testing, and so on. He snips out the sentence, making it clear that these policies were the previous policies, the policies that were lifted, and he puts the word despite in there. Now, the word despite is not in this paragraph in the original article, and this makes it seem like these policies are current, ongoing policies. 
He's rewriting what the article says to make it say something different. Jimmy has tried to worm his way out of responsibility for this by trying to say that this is at the fault of a producer. A stupid producer rewrote this article and I fired him, so problem solved. This places Jimmy in either one of two scenarios. Either he really is that malicious and has his team rewrite articles for him to read out on his show, and basically willingly put out dangerous lies because he knows his audience won't second guess him, or he really is that fucking incompetent that he doesn't fact check what he's reading on his show, or have anyone else in his team fact check what he's about to read on his show. Either way you want to go, he looks really fucking bad, but his audience does not give a single solitary shit. They don't care about facts, they only care about having their warped views reaffirmed, and Jimmy does just that. He is a grifter. He goes wherever the money is at, and he knows peddling anti-vaccine bullshit brings you in a lot of money. I mean, look at the views he pulls in with these kinds of videos. And he knows that constantly shitting on the left while offering little to no pushback to the right is also what brings in the most money. He is a disingenuous hack, not worth taking seriously, and if anyone, anyone watching this video actually takes this guy seriously, well one, get your head evaluated, and two, I just want fuck all to do with you. I'm sure you remember Predator Poachers from earlier this year, back when the EDP situation first broke. More on him later, by the way. <laughs> but, first off, I do want to say I do appreciate the fact that the Predator Poachers did expose EDP. They were the ones that set him up in those chat logs, set him up so they could meet him, and then expose him and have him admit to everything he said in those chat logs. Of course, that is all good, but too bad Chuck Goldstein, or Alex rather, is a complete piece of shit. Alex is the face of Predator Poachers, essentially. He's in all the Sting Up videos, to my knowledge. He's the guy that interviews the Predators they catch. So think of him like the Chris Hansen of this group. Too bad he is a racist piece of shit. There was a live stream of him repeatedly calling someone the n-word hard r there is also a live stream of him prank calling a blm hotline and also using the n-word hard r repeatedly in it he's an anti-mask anti-vaccine dipshit and also just a complete fucking clout chaser like for example with the edp sting op video that video was delayed for days because they wanted to make sure that they had ads enabled for that video that was his number one priority not the fact that his group cut a youtuber who had massive outreach and influence and surely had a significant number of people who were minors watching his content trying to solicit sex from someone who he thought was a 13 year old girl but rather can we monetize this video of us interviewing someone who we caught being a predatory piece of shit i understand that these videos may be your livelihood but you caught a youtuber with what three million subscribers trying to engage in a sexual relationship with someone who he thought was a 13 year old girl wouldn't you think that your number one priority would be getting the word out there, making people aware that this YouTuber they may have enjoyed watching is actually a pedophile. It just shows that Chet really doesn't care about actually catching predators, but rather the clout he gets for catching predators. It's just a big joke to him. In one of his other Sting Up videos, he did this stupid fucking bit where he made the predator he caught wear a shirt that said, I eat ass or whatever. And then in another Sting Up video, he asked the Predator, after the Predator said they have suicidal ideations, are you Jewish? The Predator said yes, and then Chet was like, well, don't kill yourself because then that would be a hate crime on yourself. Like, what? And then in the EDP video, he repeatedly made fat jokes, and look, I don't care about the feelings of these Predators, make jokes at their expense all you want, but when you're conducting sting ops with the intention of showing it to the police and having the police step in and take action, you need to have a bit more of a professional conduct. And it just says to the audience that you don't take this seriously. You never saw Chris Hansen on any of his To Catch a Predator episodes cracking jokes at the Predator's expense because he realized the severity of the situation. He knew that these people were a real threat to children, so he treated the situation with the seriousness it deserved. Again, privately, YouTube comments, wherever the fuck, make fun of these people all you want, but in Sting Up videos you intend to show authorities? Not the best idea at all. And EDP is still walking free as a result of how much this guy fumbled this case. And that is more than enough justification and the biggest reason as to why this guy is on this list. <laughs> 
I ripped on Blair White in last year's list, so why not rip on the male version of Blair White in this year's list? Calvin Dara is, or was, a trans YouTuber who routinely made content mocking and bullying other trans content creators, constantly labeling them as quote-unquote trans trenders. His reasoning for calling people this could vary from, say, a trans woman not wearing traditionally feminine clothes, or vice versa, or someone being non-binary. He did not respect non-binary people at all, and claimed that their identity is not valid. So because some trans people and agendered people may skew away from traditional gender norms, that must be because they claim to be trans or non-binary just for the clout, am I right? Even though a significant portion of the population in this country hates these groups of people, so that really doesn't make any fucking sense at all. But let's still go with that regardless. This may sound ridiculous, but this was the basis of Calvin's content. Any trans person who does not fit into his ideal vision of what a trans person supposedly should be, he would label as just a pretender. His videos mocking and bullying other trans content creators garnered in so many views and were directly responsible for the harassment of several people who were at the receiving end of his ire. Perhaps the most well-known example of this is when Calvin went after a non-binary content creator named Brennan. Brennan made a video some years ago talking about their experience with gender dysphoria, and Calvin released a video reacting to their video completely shitting on them purposely misgendering them and just saying some of the most heinous shit towards them that I'd rather not repeat in this video. His reasoning for doing this is, well, they don't really have gender dysphoria because they still have a feminine appearance despite claiming that they have gender dysphoria because they were assigned female at birth. Calvin already had a large, established fan base when he uploaded this video, and Brennan's video, before Calvin released his reaction to it, only had roughly 500 views. So as you could imagine, Calvin's video made Brennan the subject of a litany of harassment, causing them to leave the internet entirely, until just about a year ago where they came out with their side of the story and talked extensively about the harassment they received from Calvin's fan base. This has happened to several other trans and non-binary people on the internet. Calvin would make a video mocking them, Calvin's fan base would relentlessly harass these people. One of the people who were at the receiving end of Calvin's wrath even went to the point where they attempted suicide after receiving endless harassment from Calvin's fan base. Calvin only started receiving massive backlash for his abhorrent behavior just earlier this year, and he released a pretty awful apology video where he doesn't even really apologize, makes himself out to be the victim, talks about completely irrelevant controversies like people calling him racist and anti-Semitic when that was hardly a talking point in the first place, or at least hardly one that was in the mainstream when it comes to discourse surrounding Calvin Guerra. And his channel has been completely barren ever since. Maybe he left the internet entirely? I sure hope so. But before all of this backlash, his videos received an overwhelming amount of positive support. He spent years making a name for himself being one of the good transgenders in the eyes of conservatives, just like Blair White, whom he has collaborated with in the past. He did not give a fuck at all about the mental health and well-being of those he scrutinized in his videos all those years. So long as he made a sufficient amount of money, so long as he brought attention to himself, that's all that mattered to him. He only started to feel some semblance of remorse conveniently after he started to receive massive backlash for his harmful content. Content like Calvin Garrow's is legitimately dangerous because it can normalize transphobia in the minds of potentially many people, just like what Calvin Garrow's content did. The more pushback this type of content receives, the better. And to see people like Calvin Garrow and Blair White finally receive the backlash they deserve for the type of content they put out, ooh, it is just delicious. <laughs> anyway, to any trans person or non-binary person or really anyone watching this video, your identities are totally valid no matter how you present yourselves. And don't let fuckheads like Calvin Dara convince you otherwise. Anyways, let's move on. <laughs> Creepshow Art is a YouTuber I personally never heard of until her controversy blew up. 
and that is only because when the controversy was at its peak, her name was plastered all over my YouTube feed. At first, I was like, yeah, this is a YouTuber I never even heard of, so I'm not really that interested. It's probably your typical boring YouTube drama anyway. And I was like this until around late November, because December is right around the corner, and I still only had nine YouTubers on my list, so I decided to finally look into why Creepshow Art is so hated. And who oh boy, I'm glad I did that, because we are in for a doozy for this one. The drama sparked when Creepshow was exposed for posting on her own lol cow forums, posing as someone who hates her. This lasted for about three years, spanning across roughly 300 posts. She would talk shit about her YouTube peers behind their backs, and if it began and ended with this, she wouldn't be on this list. Yeah, she's a snake. Dime a dozen. But it gets worse far worse. On this lolcow forum, she posted her sister's social media with the intent of her sister getting harassed, and I'm confident that succeeded considering we're not dealing with the most stable of individuals when it comes to these lolcow forums. She tried to pin the blame on a supposed stalker she had for eight years, spoofing her IP address and posting these things onto this lolcow forum. Unfortunately for her, spoofing IP addresses doesn't work in the way she explained, so this was a pretty obvious big fat lie. And hey, hey, the drama gets even fucking worse. Turns out Creepshow doesn't have a stalker. It was actually her that was the stalker and her partner. A YouTuber by the name of Emily Artful came out and explained that Creepshow's partner had been stalking her for the better part of a decade and Creepshow had been blackmailing her with revenge porn she had of Emily in her possession. And here's the little cherry on top. The porn of Emily she has in her possession was made when Emily was 17. Creepshow more or less corroborated that this is all true by telling her fellow YouTubers that they should all disassociate with her and not defend her at all in this drama. What a fucking roller coaster. We went from petty gossiping and shit talking to shit that could get you some serious prison time. If it wasn't obvious enough, this woman is a monster. She does not deserve any type of platform anymore or any kind of fan base anymore. And thankfully, she has pretty much disappeared from the internet. For now, at least. She hasn't uploaded since June. And the sub loss she has experienced since this all broke is astronomical. Before this drama went down, she had over 500,000 subscribers. And now, at the time of recording this, she has 328,000 subscribers. Ouch. Fucking ouch. There is absolutely no coming back from this, and she would be a complete fool to try to return to YouTube. But then again, she would be far from the only person to return to YouTube after being exposed for doing some pretty serious and awful shit. More on a person who did just that later. <laughs> if the name Maximilian Muss is not familiar to you, well, I can't really blame you, but to ring some bells, he's the guy that made that obnoxious Oh Yeah Yeah song that was popular like three years ago and sparked the meme where a bunch of people would have this picture as their profile pic and spam other people's comment sections with Oh Yeah Yeah. I really do not miss that time at all. Why is he on this list, you may ask? He hasn't been relevant in the longest time. Well, earlier this year, he was caught in a firestorm after YouTuber Critical, or Penguin Zero, made a video calling him out for his despicable behavior. Max ran several Discord servers whose main intent were to harass other content creators. The size of these content creators could range from small-time streamers to some of the big names here on the internet. For example, he would instruct his community to go over to someone's Twitch stream, spam homophobic, racist slurs, some of the most vile shit you could imagine, in their chats, with the hope of getting the streamer banned off of Twitch. And apparently in some instances, this did succeed, and he mainly did this for the lols. Yes, shattering someone's dream, someone's livelihood, or potential dream and potential livelihood, just because it would be so fucking funny. There were also times where he wanted to make it seem like another content creator was instructing their community to harass another content creator. Like, for example, he made his community spam Weast Gang, along with homophobic and racist and other vile shit. Weast was another content creator that Max didn't like, and he was doing this with the hopes of not only getting that streamer he was currently sending his community out to harass, potentially banned for the lulls, but to also potentially get Weast banned for making it look like he was sending his community out to harass small streamers. This unfortunately is not the worst thing Max and his community have done, it gets even worse. Max also liked to force streamers to do things for him. Perhaps the most egregious example 
example of this is Max telling a mentally disabled streamer to literally eat his own shit under the threat of Max and his community finding and killing him. He would tell his viewers to invade videos made by small and obscure YouTube channels, and one time he even pushed one of these uploaders to tears, and that was only a drive for him to continue to harass this person. Going back to Weast, he also had his community dox and threaten to find and kill Weast. Weast's girlfriend also recently had her father pass away, and he instructed his community to make fun of that and insult her dead father. Like, how the fuck does one find joy in doing this shit to other people? I do not get it at all. He has self-admitted that he did all of this deplorable shit just for attention, just for people to make videos about him. He does not give a shit at all. So long as people are paying attention to him and talking about the disgusting shit he is doing, that's all that matters to him. Not the people he harasses or anything like that. And believe it or not, this isn't even the worst of it. Max has deleted several Discord servers because his community would routinely share child pornography on them. And he didn't care at all. Apparently, according to Max, this is all just an inside joke. Yes, sharing your own child pornography, just a joke. Just a joke, bro. Nothing serious. Anytime a YouTuber called him out for this shit, he would try his best to sweep it under the rug and get that video struck down. In the fallout, after Critical made his video calling all of this shit out, Maximilian Muss's channel disappeared. And then he came back like a month later, and as of right now, his channel still exists, but there's only one video left on it. I would hope we will never hear from Max again, but when you're this shameless over being a complete trash bag of a human being, we'll probably hear from him again in some way, shape, or form. If we haven't already, forgive me for not being the most up-to-date when it comes to this piece of shit. But hey, guess what? We still got four more YouTubers to go. <laughs> oh, goody. <laughs> James Charles is a beauty YouTuber whose content I've only ever watched when I needed help falling asleep. And that's true, by the way. Beauty videos have always done wonders whenever I've had trouble falling asleep. But we're not talking about his snooze fest content here. We're talking about him liking to groom underage boys. Earlier this year on TikTok, a 16-year-old boy came out with allegations of James Charles pressuring him into sending explicit photos. The boy was uncomfortable with this and even told James he refuses to take explicit photos of himself and send it to him, but James completely disregarded this and still pressed him for photos regardless. James Charles would have sexually explicit conversations with the boy, and shortly after the 16-year-old came out with his allegations, James Charles was quick to deny and say that he thought that this boy was 18 years old, and said he would use this as a learning experience to ask for ID or a passport from now on before engaging in such conversations with people online. The only problem here is is that in this boy's bio on TikTok, it clearly states that he is 16. After these allegations came out, more boys came forward and corroborated the story. Another boy said that right away he told James Charles that he was 17 years old, and while nothing explicitly sexual happened in these conversations between this boy and James Charles, James was still very creepy in these conversations, calling him things like cute and continually flirting with him. Another boy came forward and shared screenshots that served as proof that he did talk to James, and said that eventually James begged him to do quote-unquote disgusting things in a video call. After all of this snowballed into something huge, James Charles made a video that more or less tried to justify his disgusting behavior, saying things like, I'm single and I'm desperate for a partner, as if it's normal behavior to groom underage people when you're desperate for a partner. Not to mention James Charles is literally at celebrity status at this point. When you're that high on the totem Paul, I'd imagine it's not that hard getting a partner, but whatever. He then did the typical thing that YouTubers do when they're in hot water. Disappear for a few months, wait for people to forget their controversy, and then come back. And when James Charles came back, oh, his fan base was all over that. It was like nothing ever fucking happened. And it still is like that to this day. He uploads his videos that garner in millions of views, a lot of support, and you have a shitload of people in the comments section saying things like, We love you, James! We love your content so much! We forgive you! We're so glad that you're back! Completely ignoring the fact 
that he groomed underage boys, but I guess that's just a little oopsie that can be forgiven for these people. Fuck his fans. Anyone who still shows this piece of shit support is enabling this disgusting behavior, is giving the Predator the green light to continue said disgusting behavior, because I'm more than sure that James Charles is well aware that he has a huge fan base that is willing to look the other way, so why not continue to prey on underage boys? Because it's not like he's gonna get a significant amount of pushback from his fan base. So if more of these allegations come out in the future, the people who will be partially at fault for this continuing are the people who showed him support, were willing to look the other way and cut him some slack after these allegations came out. And this is the biggest reason why I hate celebrity worship or YouTuber worship or whatever the fuck, because it leads to people justifying or just completely ignoring serious shit like this. They think that just because their favorite YouTuber is engaging in this awful behavior, it's okay, they make content I like, so I'm willing to look the other way. Meanwhile, they would never, ever cut the same amount of slack for any Joe Schmo engaging in the same exact disgusting behavior. But I already made a whole rant about James Charles's fans just looking the other way and not caring at all about the situation and still showing their support for a predator, so I'm not gonna harp on any more about it here. All in all, fuck James Charles. <laughs> You all knew that this one was coming. EDP445, former football ranter, former YouTuber that talked about shitting in toilets, jacking off, and all of this other weird shit. Look, if you thought my porn rant series was weird and uncomfortable, this guy dials it up to 20. And I'm sure you all know why he's on this list. He was caught trying to solicit sex from someone who he thought was a 13-year-old girl. But oopsie, it was actually a group that catches predators just like EDP. The chat logs exchanged between EDP and this decoy of a 13-year-old girl were legitimately disturbing. EDP sent a picture of a giant turd he left in a toilet for some fucking reason. When they both agreed to meet up, EDP talked about eating her out and went into gross detail about how he wants to have sex with someone who he thought was a 13 year old girl. And then when he goes to the location where he thinks he's going to meet this 13 year old girl in person finally, he meets up with the predator poachers and he does this half-assed attempt to save his ass by saying, oh, I'm here to pick up a cupcake. Why the fuck would you go to an apartment complex to pick up a fucking cupcake? I never understood that. But after that, EDP confirms everything he said in those chat logs were indeed from him, and he did go there with the intention to have sex with a 13-year-old girl. And then when Alex from the Predator Poachers begins to call the police, EDP starts to fucking panic. He's like, please don't call the police, dude. I promise I'll get some help. I promise I'll become a better person. Please don't call the police. So what the fuck ever happened to complain? Lying. Like you said Dante Wright should have done before he was gunned down by police. Sucks being on the receiving end now, doesn't it? I just had to throw that in there, I'm sorry. <laughs> Following that incident, EDP's channel was rightfully terminated and there is no salvaging his reputation. He has tried migrating to other websites, he has tried making his own websites, but every attempt to make a comeback has crashed and burned. I still do wholeheartedly believe that EDP is still a threat though, because some months ago, another group of people decided to decoy as a young girl and got into EDP's DMs and right away EDP was like, who I'm taking a shit right now and saying largely the same things that he was saying to the previous decoy at first. The only difference being is he didn't go to the same lengths as he did with the previous decoy, and right when this decoy revealed their age, which I believe was 14, I think, EDP blocked them. But still, he was getting into the flirty stuff even before knowing their age. Who's to say he won't prey on a real young girl and then use the excuse, well, I didn't know her age or she lied about her age as a way to get away scot-free. This man deserves no platform on any social media site, no matter how obscure it may be, because he is legitimately dangerous and should not be within a thousand mile radius of a minor. He so obviously doesn't care either, even after being being exposed as a predator, he still talks all this shit like, I'm EDP, I'm famous, I got all these fans, I don't give a fuck what you think about me, I'm better than you. He just seems not phased at all, and it's incredible to me, for all the wrong reasons of course, because I've never seen a YouTuber act this way after being cancelled for doing something so awful. And it's not like this was an entirely new revelation, because people like Coldraven were showing chat logs between EDP and mine 
manners that were heavily inappropriate, even before the Predator Poachers. I remember before this whole thing blew up, I even heard about EDP potentially being a predator. The warning signs were there for a long time, it seems, and his fans stuck with him until they just couldn't anymore. And this plays even more into why I hate celebrity or YouTuber worship with a burning fucking passion, because his fans saw this and were like, eh, he's the funny fat guy that talks about blowing up Chipotle toilets, so I can just turn a blind eye to these pretty concerning DMs between him and minors. And when it became popular to hate on him, because through his own admission he has a serious problem, that's when they decide to turn on him. And not when the warning signs were there when he still had a massively popular YouTube channel and had a lot of influence over a lot of people, including quite a few minors, I'm sure. And by the way, this is completely irrelevant to everything else I've talked about in this segment, but I still want to bring it up. EDP's content was just god-fucking-awful. I do not understand for the life of me how anyone above the age of like 12 saw any appeal in his content but whatever that's the least of my problems with EDP. And wait, wait, it just dawned on me. He wanted to eat a 13 year old girl's pussy. EDP is short for eat that pussy. 445, 4 plus 4 plus 5 equals 13. Oh no! <laughs> Well, this is where things get extremely, extremely dark. Chris Chan, as a person who has been at the receiving end of quite possibly the most dedicated harassment campaign in internet history. Seriously, this shit goes back to, like, the early 2000s. I definitely have a little bit to say about that, but first, let's focus on what Chris Chan even did. It was exposed earlier this year that she had a sexual relationship with her 79-year-old mother that has dementia. Chris Chan describes the experience as a positive one. She called it soul bonding. I think I just tasted some vomit in my mouth. Oh, Jesus Christ. She laid out all of the disgusting details to one of her very, very dedicated trolls, who is also a terrible person in their own right, by the way, but more on that later. After this all came out to the public's knowledge, this, of course, erupted into a huge firestorm. And in August, Chris Chan was taken into police custody, and now she faces up to 10 years in prison, potentially, if found guilty of incest. This is just a god-awful story all around and of course Chris Chan is a terrible human being for doing this but I do want to hone in on the people who have spent years and years of their life paying attention to her harassing her trolling her and making her do all sorts of awful things including having a sexual relationship with her mother it was a woman who was part of the Christorian community or whatever the fuck you want to call it who ultimately convinced her to do this with her mother. It just speaks so many volumes of the internet's treatment of the mentally ill. Now obviously most of the blame still falls upon Chris Chan because most normal people don't have sexual relationships with their parents just because they were asked to. But still, it gets you wondering about an alternate reality where Chris Chan wasn't this huge internet figure who was a punching bag for so many trolls for so many years. She obviously suffers from severe mental illness, and she perhaps could have still done something very awful, even without the internet notoriety. But still, just skimming through these multiple documentaries on Chris Chan, it's very obvious that these trolls took advantage of her mental illness, took advantage of her mental illness to make her do all sorts of crazy things just for the lols, and then it escalated to the point where someone actually convinced her to have a sexual relationship with her mother. And where the fuck is the humor in that, by the way? Raping your 79-year-old mother with dementia. So fucking hilarious to some mentally ill woman out there. It's just an immensely disgusting, disturbing, infuriating, and depressing story all around. With absolutely zero heroes in it. I would hope that this would open the door for people to finally collectively discuss how awful the internet treats the mentally ill. And to finally come up with ways to effectively combat against it. But it probably won't. Because... The main draw of the internet for so many people 
is that they could act as sociopathic as they want with little to no consequence because they were doing it in the safety of their own home behind a screen and a keyboard. So yes, Chris Chen is an awful and disgusting human being, but it's so obvious that the community of people who have been trolling her for years have made such an impact in her life at this point that it is undeniable. I mean, one of them literally told her to do something that might now land her in prison for over 10 years for fuck's sakes. But yeah, that's all I gotta say on the topic. Oh god, my stomach hurts. Ugh. But I still have one more YouTuber to talk about. How could this possibly be topped? Well... <laughs> it's a safe bet you've never heard of this YouTube channel. I certainly haven't before hearing what this guy did because I don't pay attention to the incel sphere here on YouTube, and hopefully you don't either. His channel was the usual incel scree. I can't get laid, so therefore that is somehow society's fault, and more importantly, women's fault. And he also complained and threw pity parties for himself, claiming that he was too ugly to get laid and get a partner, which by the way, too ugly doesn't exist. Put yourself out there enough and perhaps adopt a more likable personality, and I'm sure you would find at least one person that is willing to be with you. That is dating advice from someone who is single. <laughs> he also went on the usual misogynist rants like, women are shallow, simple-minded, they're only driven by money, you know, shit you hear from all these kinds of people. So why is he on this list? And more importantly, why is he the worst person on this list? Because everything I've said thus far is bad, of course, but not worse than some of the other people I've talked about thus far. Well, here is that part now. In August, Professor Waffles, or Jake Davison rather, completely snapped and went on a shooting spree, killing five people. Two of his victims include his mother and a three-year-old girl. Following the shooting, Jake then, of course, shot himself dead. This is what I hate about this guy and Elliot Roger. They can't just take themselves out. They gotta take other people with them because they are so frustrated that they can't get laid. Yeah, because that is somehow at the fault of a fucking three-year-old. I struggle to empathize with these people because while most of them won't go out and kill others, they still hold that same detest for society that drove this guy to do something so heinous over something that is completely their own fault. And not to mention, I see so many incels online hold someone like Elliot Roger in reverence and call him a hero. You can't get laid and that makes you sad and angry. Tough shit! Why do people have to lose their lives, or a family member, or a friend, or even their child, over your petty fucking problem? There is so much more to life than sex and having a partner. I'm single. Would I like a partner? Sure. But I'm not blaming society. I'm not blaming women for my own problem because I don't get out there enough. I'm not a very social person. So the problem completely lies on my own shoulders only. I'm still able to find pleasure in doing other things, though. It doesn't completely consume my life like it does with these people. I just can't stand the woe is me attitude, the constant blaming of society, the blaming of women, the blaming of people that are not themselves. They don't even even want to think for a second that perhaps that exact attitude is why they can't get laid, is why they can't get a partner. They don't want to better themselves by improving things like their attitude and mindset to at least give them some chance of meeting that special someone. But instead, despite all of that, they expect people to come flocking towards them. Because yeah, that's totally how the world works. And that's the exact reason why I just cannot empathize with incels at all. The problem is never their fault, but instead society's fault, women's fault, anyone who they want to use as a scapegoat. And unfortunately, in cases like this and Elliot Rogers, innocent people who had nothing to do with their failure in getting laid died. Should have just turned the gun on yourselves. So with all of that said, congratulations Jake Davison, Professor Waffles, you're 2021's worst YouTuber, at least in my book. So that was the list, there were some doozies in there to say the least, but we're not quite done yet. Keeping with tradition, I am going to discuss one dishonorable mention. And also keeping with tradition, I did not get a drumroll sound effect. I am instead going to use my bed as a drumroll sound effect. I'm primitive like that. Anyway, the dishonorable mention of 2021 is this dude. 
more out of obligation than anything else, because I knew if I didn't have this guy in this video in any sort of capacity, there'd be at least a few people screaming and yelling at me, where's Nika Kato? So here he is. He gets a dishonorable mention because I feel quite a few more YouTubers were considerably worse than him this year. Mukbang videos suck. This guy doesn't seem like the most pleasant person out there from what I've heard from so many other people, so I feel dishonorable mention is good enough for this guy. If you want to know my in-depth thoughts on the situation surrounding this guy, and especially my thoughts on the hate base surrounding this guy, I made a video about him a few months ago. It's called Nikocado Avocado, I Don't Care, or something along those lines. You can find it pretty easily, so put in the effort. But with all that said, let's finally wrap up this video. I'm gonna say something that I don't think I've ever said at the end of any of my other thousand plus videos on this channel. Thank you so much for watching. I say this because this is my final video. It might be obvious to some people, or not so obvious to those who don't look at a fucking calendar, but YouTube in 2021 just... Wasn't so great. YouTube in 2020 wasn't so great either. Same with the years prior, and I'm sure 2022 won't be any better, but despite all of that, this is still going to be my last video. In 2021. <laughs> Did you really think I'd fucking quit YouTube? And just stick my retirement announcement at the end of a 40 plus minute video? I'm sure most people are not even gonna bother watching all the way through. Come the fuck on. But no, really, thank you for watching, and I appreciate all of you. Genuinely. 2021 was a pretty decent year for this channel. I know it wasn't the most booming year for this channel. I, my channel's dwindled, dwindled in popularity the past few years, or... Popularity in quotes, because, you know, I was never relevant to begin with, but still. As long as video making is fun, I will still be making videos, and I plan on making videos all the way through 2022, probably 2023, and the foreseeable future beyond that. It's just surreal to think that 2021 is already coming to a close. Jesus Christ, where does the time go? Anyways, I think I wrapped up this video well enough. Here is to more YouTubers fucking up royally in 2022, and I genuinely mean it because I'm gonna need that happening for next year's list, and also it's just great entertainment, let's be honest here. Stay the dumpster fire that you are, YouTube, I love you that way. <laughs> anyway, that's all I have to say, Bye bye Here's to another year of content.